Hello everyone, I'm Chris Bachman. I'm the faculty advisor for Baja and Formula at Cal State LA, and I'm putting together a short video on drive dynamics for the team. Um, the difference between the overall uh, dynamics of the car and drive dynamics is we're specifically talking about the, um, the motion of the vehicle going forward and backwards, or, or what we call longitudinally. So let's get into it. So first, First thing we need to look at anytime we're talking about uh, dynamics is the forces. So uh, just a little bit about the coordinate system. So uh, the convention that I'm going to use is uh, X is forward, C is down, and as you're sitting in the car to your right is a positive in the Y direction. Uh, that's the common coordinate system. So let's begin by looking at all the forces that are on the vehicle. So you have the normal forces on the front and rear tire. In this case, I'm looking at a rear wheel drive vehicle. So you have the uh, force on the rear tire propelling it forward. You have the weight of the vehicle. You have rolling resistance um, on, the, on the vehicle holding it back. And you have the force of drag also pushing it back. So if we relate the mass times the acceleration of the vehicle to all of these forces, we get the relationship below. What we can do now is relate uh, the all of these terms to the power of the engine. So the engine power can be related to the force propelling the vehicle forward times the velocity at which you're going. And so we can now uh, solve, uh, you'll see all the other terms on the right, and you can see what the power of the engine goes into. So one, it can go into accelerating. Two, it can go into overcoming the rolling resistance, overcoming drag, or overcoming the portion of the weight in the uh, longitudinal direction. And what we can look at next is begin to um, look at the terms that go into the rolling resistance and the drag. So uh, the first and last term to the same, but in the middle, we can see that the rolling resistance is related to the normal force on the vehicle. So that's the weight times cosine of the angle of the of the, of the gradient you're going up times the coefficient of rolling resistance, which will depend on the train and your tires um, uh, and a lot of other factors that can also go, could be included into your um, drivetrain system. We also have the drag force. So the drag force is related to half the air density times the frontal area times the drag coefficient times the velocity squared. So as you can see, when you look at all these terms that what's consuming uh, power from your engine at very high speeds, this drag term will be very dominant because of this velocity cube. But at low speeds, you can have combinations uh, from all three, uh, depending on the setup of your vehicle. So let's look at a couple of just examples. So if we look at an example for the, uh, you know, our formula SAE vehicle, I'm plotting on the left, the, the possible acceleration in Gs from the leftover power that you have. And then in uh, for the right on the right vertical scale, I have the power which would be consumed by rolling resistance and drag in black and gray and for different velocities. So as you'd expect, you'd see that the drag power in gray uh, is, a, um, is drastically increasing with, with velocity and that the rolling resistance is a linear function with, with velocity. And that at very, very high speeds, you can see that the, what we'll call the propulsion limit acceleration, what you're able to accelerate, how much you're able to accelerate with your engine, um, limited by your engine and drivetrain, is going to be, it's going to be decreasing all the way till about 90 miles per hour, between 90 and 100. And so you know, your top speed would be between 90 and 100, and that's you know, why they'll make the course quite windy. And uh, at very low speeds, you can see you have you know, excess power where you can uh, potentially accelerate really fast. We'll talk more about that going forward. So the, let's just do thrown in some numbers for a Baja vehicle because you have much less, much less power. I put everything on the same scale on the left. And you can see because you're off-road uh, and the, the tires will have quite a bit more rolling resistance uh, due to their just construction. So see, you're going to typically be more dominated by rolling resistance. Your engine's going to be fighting that more than the power. And 
uh, until they get about even closer maybe to your top speed if you're getting up into the 30 to 5 to 40 mile per hour range. So, but can you, you know, based on what I've shown you so far, you'd say, well, it seems like you can almost accelerate infinitely fast from a stop. And, you know, our experience tells us that's not true. You would need, you know, really high gearing and you need infinite traction. So that's, you know, for example, why like a sprinter has blocks to start with because they don't want to be limited by traction when they're starting their sprint. They want to be able to push off of something that's fixed to the ground. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't have that luxury in our vehicles. And what really propels us forward is really the deformation of the tire, which can actually be quite large. I'm showing you the material of a dragster with, you know, really extreme deformation of the tire. Looking more of a cartoon schematic, um, what you can find is this deformation causes what appears to be slip. And so although you don't uh, often have like actual slipping, uh, where uh, it appears that the tire is spinning faster than you would expect based on the radius and the velocity. Um, and this is because the tire is actually deforming and is actually slowing down as it comes into the contact patch and then speeding up as it leaves the contact patch. And we'll see this can be used to figure out, uh, to describe the deformation of the tire. And so you have the angular velocity omega times the effective radius. And this kind of you know, effective radius, the definition of it can depend on the standard that you're using minus the velocity. So if it was, you know, rotating at exactly the speed you'd expect, this term would be zero and you'd have uh, your slip ratio would be zero. And so the slip ratio just normalizes this by the velocity. And so you can often talk about it as a percent. And so the higher this number is, the more the tire is deforming and the harder it is uh, working to propel you forward. And you'll have a larger FX. So FX is, is pushing you, is pushing you forward and we'll normally normalize this by the downforce. So it's like a coefficient of friction. We call this the normalized longitudinal force on the tire. And you'll see when, when you're actually driving it forward, you'll have negative values. And that's just because of the definition of the Z direction. So here's a plot. And so you haven't uh, subscribed to the tire test consortium as a formula team, you definitely should, or as Baja team beginning to look up data on the tires is definitely a, a great place to start. And so if we look at these forces propelling you forward FX normalized uh, by the downforce, what you'll uh, begin to see um, is that the normalized uh, force decreases with downforce. So you see the black is you know, not very much downforce all the way to red, which is a lot. And so, and what you'll see is on the right here, this is driving you forward. And on the left, this is, this is braking. Uh, and it's somewhat symmetric, you know, roughly symmetric, but not completely symmetric, uh, of course. And um, you also notice that this will depend on a lot of setup conditions. So right now, I've just plotted the data at a specific inclination angle, which you can think of like camber uh, for, you know, it's way we, uh, another way to kind of look at the camber of the tire, especially for a single tire, uh, the pressure, the slip angle. So it means the tires just rolling straight forward and at a certain speed. So all of these things, of course, of course matter for these values, but what you can see for this formula car is that, you know, assuming that you know, maybe you have 200 pounds of downforce on your rear tires, so you're in this blue category, you get this normalized um, uh, longitudinal force around negative three. Keep in mind that this testing is done on uh, this 100 grit paper, so you normally have to multiply this by, you know, 60% for your tires. So you should go analyze the data and see what you and um, one, to help you select your tires, but also to figure out your vehicle dynamics, at least in a, you know, a straight line, just as a place to start. So, you know, typically you're probably in the, the grip range of about two for your tire and formula. So if we just look up a little bit of data, I, you know, it's actually been, it's not easy to find some data, but some rough data for something you might expect for a Baja vehicle, you'll see that, you know, the definitions are a little bit different from this paper but you know, still plotting the longitudinal and the squares and uh, normalized by the downforce. And you'll see that it increases to about 0.6. So you have a lot less grip, of course, uh, on clay than you would for a you know, tire on, on asphalt. So, and one thing you can begin to see is, all right, well, the downforce really matters here for figuring out what the maximum forces we can get propelling this forward. How much traction do we really have? 
So let's do a little analysis, starting with the Baja vehicle or any four-wheel drive vehicle, as it's a simpler case. We'll draw all the forces on it, driving it forward. And let's just talk about uh, while accelerating on flat ground. And so we can, we can draw the acceleration vector as in the opposite direction with a minus mass times acceleration. And we can uh, include that um, include that in here, and you'll see that'll be important in our two-wheel drive in the next step. And we can say that relate the forward acceleration to the force propelling the vehicle forward on the front wheel and the rear wheel divided by the mass. And those forces pulling you forward are going to be the down forces uh, multiplied by the normalized longitudinal force. And of course, you know, if we didn't want to have a separate separate normalized longitudinal force for each term, we need to have a weighted average here. So you can think about this kind of an average depending on, you know, you'd have to bias it if you have more downforce on one in the front than the rear. Uh, but, um, you know, watch our workshop series after this if you want to get the more, more detailed calculations. But roughly, we can then say that these uh, normal forces are going to be related to the weight or the mass times gravity. When we plug this in, we can see that our acceleration is really limited by a weighted average of our normalized uh, longitudinal force, or you, know, you can almost say this like a coefficient of friction times acceleration of gravity. And so, and so this is you know, how we usually think about these GG versus velocity graphs, which we'll talk about more, but we've been talking about the longitudinal acceleration. You can see typically it's usually limited to, here they're showing about one G going forward. And so, and so it's an easy calculation in your head. How much grip do you have? That's how much you can accelerate going forward. And you can see that that will actually, this face dripping back is because now you've entered into the proportion limited area, which we'll get a little more into this. But next let's look at a two wheel drive case. So the two wheel drive case is a little more complicated because you, I've just removed the force propelling you forward on the front wheel and just have the rear wheel. And here you can do with this minus MA vector, you can actually do a sum of the moments about the, about the front tire. And what you will what you will find when you when you do this is that the normal force on your rear wheel, which is what we're going to need to multiply by our longitudinal coefficient, our longitudinal, uh, our normalized longitudinal force, kind of like our coefficient of friction, will have a static term. So you have the weight times the uh, distance from the front tire to the CG divided by the wheelbase, it's kind of like your your static weight distribution on the on the rear tire. So if B goes all the way back to your full wheelbase, you know, you have all of the weight of your car on your rear tire. Plus you have a term for your, your weight shift to the rear as you accelerate forward, which is related to the acceleration times the height of the CG of the car. And so, you know, you could increase the CG of your car to have more weight shift towards the rear, which gives you more grip. Uh, you wouldn't do this in practice because there's a lot, a lot of better reasons to decrease your CG height than this argument here. So, so in practice, you'd never, you would never increase the height for that reason. Um, and so if we do what we did before and we relate this acceleration in the X direction uh, to the force on the rear tire divided by the, by the mass, and then we break this force uh, in the rear, pushing the car forward to the normal force times the normalized longitudinal force. We can see that we are now, you know, have a similar limitation based on our our our, um, our downforce in the our normal force in the rear. And if you want to solve for the acceleration and pull it out of here, what you can what you can do is um, get this relationship here. But really, I think it's easiest just to think about, you know, how much how much weight you, of your weight is on the rear and how much weight shift do you have towards the towards the back. So last little comment here is don't neglect the rotational inertia for, for any uh, detailed calculations as the rotational inertia can also add a significant portion to the total inertia of your system for accelerating forward, especially as it, you get to the components that rotate faster than the, than the wheels and get closer to your engine. And let's put the whole, if we put the whole thing together, what we can see is for like a Formula SAE vehicle, if we look at the acceleration limitation of about one, because you know we had our max grip was maybe about two, and let's say we have about a 
you know, about half that grip available to the rear. Maybe it's slightly higher than this potentially, but you know, roughly one that you know, our acceleration early on were what we call traction limited, you know, almost all the way up to 30 miles per hour, limited by you know, how much grip do we have. And it's not until actually these higher speeds that we begin to be limited by what our engine, what our engine can do. Keep in mind that you know, your, how well you design your drivetrain, you can also won't necessarily be able to hit this perfect line. And if we do a similar, we look at a similar uh, thing for the Baja vehicle, We'll see that you know, assuming you're going to a four-wheel drive vehicle these days, you have less grip, but you have all of your, you have you know, all four tires available to propel you forward. Your traction limit is you know about the same, but because you have much less uh, powerful engine, you know, starting to get between five and ten miles per hour, you'll start to be limited by you'll start to be limited by the you know, Briggs and Stratton engine and not by not by your tires. Um, so. With that, uh, thank you for your, for your time. I hope you found this useful. If, uh, if you want to learn more, check out our workshop series, which goes into more details and we do some example calculations. And up next, we'll be looking at the lateral direction and cornering dynamics. Good luck. Boys,